Welcome to Netting Media. I have Andreas Miller here. Um, hello, Andreas. How are you doing? Hello. I'm doing fine. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Uh, we're going to be, uh, um, I'm, I'm going to be reading some quotes and then Andreas is going to make a comment about it or react to it. So here is the first quote that I have. There is nothing to seek and nothing to find. Honored people from Jesus to Ramana Maharshi points out to this utter simplicity. I have no idea how it can be overheard so often. That quote is by Andreas. <laughs> Andreas <Moore>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've heard this before. <laughs> if you want to expand on that. Yeah, well, that's basically the message, so to speak. There is no one. There isn't anyone. And there's nothing to seek and there's nothing to find. And I knew when I wrote that, I was thinking about people who think that Ramana, for example, has a very complicated teaching. But in the end, also how I understand him, which is a story, of course, it's as simple as that. There is no path. There is, there is no one who's unenlightened. There is no one. It's utterly, what we speak about is utterly simple. Impossible to be done, but the simplicity is that it is like that already. Brilliant. So here's the first quote that's not from Andreas. <laughs> When we turn the mind inwards, God manifests as the inner consciousness. This is from Ramana Maharshi. Well, yeah, I'm, in regards to this message, this is just a story. This is or just a story. This would just refer to the personal setup, to be honest. Because within a personal setup or in a spiritual setup, the idea might be that consciousness is God, pure I am, so to speak. And you can realize that by turning the attention inwards. Um, it's not really wrong, so to speak, but what this message is saying is that this I am, what in that statement he would regard as God, is illusory as well. It would just drop. It's not God. It's not real. There isn't anyone. So... Oh, I can't hear you. Brilliant. <laughs> this one is uh, from Sri uh, Nisargadatta Maharaj. All separation, every kind of estrangement and alienation is false. All is one. Uh, yes, one could say so. Yes, of course, I would say all is none <laughs> because there is <laughs> because there isn't anyone who experiences one or that there is one thing, in the end, there is no experience at all. So all there is is none. But yes, there is no separation at all. And in that sense, also no alienation. The alienation that the person lives in comes from separation, where I am me, and everything else is not me, separate, alien, something else than me. But that's the dream. Thank you. The next one is boundary lines of any type are never found in the real world itself, but only in the imagination of the map makers by Ken Wilbur. Oh, all right. Well, I'm not so familiar with Ken Wilbur, so I don't really know what he wanted to say. But of course, there are no boundaries, really. There is no separation, and I would and I would regard the subject object reality as living in boundaries, where I am an object, where everything else is objects, separate objects. But that's a complete dream. There are no boundaries, but not for someone. There are no boundaries because there is no one. There is no subject and no object. That's why I would say there are no boundaries. Here's the next one. 
The world exists only when we think about it. Creation stories are for children. In reality, the world is created every moment by Jean Klein. Well, <laughs> I wouldn't say so, really, because there just is no world. It never really exists. And the whole assumption that there is some kind of existence comes from this sense of existence in here, this notion of existence, which I would say is illusory. Or that's the surprise in the end. In liberation, that is the surprise that this notion of existence just never happened. It doesn't have any substance at all. In that sense, there never is a world. And in that sense, I wouldn't say that it's the thoughts that, that create the world. It's this notion of existence that is the notion of existence, basically. Thank you. Uh, to be conscious of being, you need to reclaim consciousness from the mind. This is one of the most essential tasks on your spiritual journey. This is from Eckhart Tolle. Well, to me, this would only be a personal, this would be within the dream, because it's exactly this self-consciousness, which is illusory. There is no real consciousness, and there is no self-conscious about itself. <laughs> that is the dreamt reality. I understand that it can feel like that from within the person, so to speak, but it's this setup which is completely illusory. Andreas, while we're, we are on Eckhart Tolle, what do you think of the power of now? Well, <laughs> well, I've only read it half, actually, to be honest, and I've read it more than 10, 10 years ago. But as far as I understood it, it's, it's a story. Because there is no now. There is no one in the now. It's, it's, it's describing a, the basis of the personal experience. That's my impression. I'm now here and all I have is this moment. That's exactly the, the personal experience, describing the person's experience, which is illusory. This is the dream. I'm now here as an experienced reality, experiencing something, whatever there is. That is the dream. <laughs> Thank you for clearing that up. <laughs> um, oh, this one. Uh, we take that which is unreal to be real, and that which is real to be unreal. Rupert Spira. Yes. What to say on that? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> there's just no we. That's the thing. There's just no we who could take anything. So on the one hand, yes, what the person regards as real, namely itself and what it experiences doesn't exist as such. So, there's no way to take anything in a certain way. I don't know what he meant, of course. Now that we're in the topic of Rupert, what does it mean by abiding in awareness? Well, is there I, such a thing as abiding in awareness? Well, that's the thing. What, what would that be? When I say I have no clue at all, I basically mean, well, what would that be? What awareness is he talking about? And who would be there to abide in, in that awareness? It sounds like a state. But again, I don't know what he means, so to speak. It's just my comments on that statement. But for me, it doesn't make sense at all. Thank you. It sounds as if it's a place where something or someone or whatever can abide in. And there just is no place. There is no real reality where someone can be or reside in or abide in and all those things. Perfect, thank you. This one again is from Nisargadatta. 
the consciousness in you and the consciousness in me, apparently two, really one, seek unity that is love. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, it would need a long elaboration on that, actually. I mean, one, of course, one could all say it like that, but it, my impression is he refers to this sense of I, and that's completely illusory. So there is no consciousness in you, and there is no consciousness in me. It would just be the personal experience. It's a concept, actually. And of course, I mean, the interesting thing is that seen from the person, one could actually say it. Because if, if everyone leaves their personal story away, then everyone ends up with pure I am, pure consciousness. And if you think it through, you can actually say that it's the same consciousness within everyone. So one could come to that conceptual conclusion that there is one consciousness only, and that is which we are. But again, what, what turns out in liberation and what I think also turned out for, for Nisigadatta in the end is that this consciousness is utterly illusory, illusory and it would be the seed of separation, so to speak. That's brilliant, but thank you. Uh, words do not contain the truth. They only point us to it. This is Benermala. Yeah, well, nothing really points to anything. There is no pointing to truth. So there's just what seems to be happening. But as it already is, as everything already is whole and complete, there can't be any kind of pointing. Nothing points to truth. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Uh, <laughs> great knowledge sees all in one. Small knowledge breaks down into the many. Swang Su. Um, well, it, it would still be knowledge. I mean, th that's why all most spiritual teachings end up saying there is one coming actually from this experience of I am, which knows I am one, or there is, is one, there is one thing, so to speak. And of course, in, spirit, in spirituality, this would re, be regarded as highest knowledge, probably. <laughs> and, and that getting lost in stories, that was basically to see many, is low knowledge. But both are knowledge. So both are dreamt. There is there aren't there aren't many, but there is also not one. There is no one, which means there isn't one. There isn't one small thing in here, and there isn't one reality out there. There is none. There is no one, and there is no circumstance which is real. Spot on. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, when I heard the sound of the bell ringing, there was no I and no bell, just the ringing. Tony Parsons. Well, yes. Yeah, it's an apparent description of what we talk about here. But basically, it's, of course, it's another story because it's an apparent description. But yeah, trying to say, all there is is what happens for no one, but it can't be known. How that actually is can't be known. Thank you. This one, uh, to study the way of the Buddha is to study your own self. To study your own self is to forget yourself. To forget yourself is to have the objective world prevail in you by Dogen. Uh, what does prevail mean? In, you know, I'm, la I'm lacking a word here. Prevail means to, um, to stay. Let me, let me Google it. Yeah. I have an idea. 
Just a second. Hmm. Well, why you Google, I could say, just not knowing this one word. Uh, my impression is it's a it's a description of what we talk about here. It's, it's again another. Oh, thing. okay. To to prove more powerful than opposing forces to be victorious. I was way off. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I still didn't get it. <laughs> Can you read the, the whole? Uh, quote? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to study the Buddha, a study the way of the Buddha is to study your own self. So to study your own self is to forget yourself. To forget yourself is to have the objective world prevail in you. Mm. So to be for the world to be more powerful than you. Yes, or to I mean, persuade to do something. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I mean, I mean, I completely wouldn't say it like that. And it might be a description of what we talk about here, but I wouldn't say it like that. Because in the end, it may sound as if there is a connection between seeking and the end of me, which there isn't really. But in the end, that's the turnout. There isn't anyone. So there is no self. And in the end, I mean, that's another thing. There being no self actually is not the end of a path. It's actually where it all begins. There isn't anyone. Thank you. This one is from Clement of Alexandria. Silence is the mother of everything that has come out of the, from the death. And silence kept quiet about what she was unable to describe, the unspeakable. <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> I would just say nothing happens. That's basically what some people regard as silence. It's silence because there is no happening in the first place. But there's also nothing that's coming out of silence. There is no appearance coming out of nothingness. In that sense, all there is is silence or all there is is no thing. But it's not a circumstance or a state. It would just be another word for something that's unspeakable because it's actually no thing. In that sense, why not call it silence? But my impression is that in, it's often very mystified, that word, silence. It isn't. It's just this, basically. And there seems to be, um, you know, silence. People talk about stillness all the time. Oh, yeah, I mean, for most people, yeah, yeah. it's a feeling. It's either it's either having no thoughts, or it's a it, it's this very meaningful kind like of peacefulness, peaceful state where stories aren't really allowed and stuff like that. But that's completely artificial. That's that's. <laughs> There's a really no no connection to what we speak about here. I agree. I agree. When I was seeking, I used to try to find that stillness. And then the moment my dog barks, I'll be like, I lost my stillness. Absolutely. Yeah, I've heard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know that very well. I've been there too. You've been there too. Yeah. <laughs> I've been there too. Trying to meditate, you know, and trying to quiet the thoughts, yeah, whatever somehow, that is. Somehow keep a certain space or create a certain atmosphere. Yeah. Kind of meditative stuff like that. Yeah. 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 There's no connection to what we speak about. Thank you. Uh, this one is from Ramesh Sassoon. The mind is the projection machine, which constantly projects pictures on the screen we call reality. <clears throat> yeah, to me, this sounds actually pretty much like an awareness picture and like as if we are or as if we actually are awareness, having this blank screen of awareness and uh, that the illusion is the pictures that we project onto it. So this, was, this is basically where a lot of spirituality happens in, in that concept. I'm pure awareness and the illusion is if I attach stories to that. And if we come back to pure awareness, the experience of pure awareness, that's the natural reality, so to speak. 
But this would all still be personal because there is no awareness in the first place. There is no screen. That's the thing. The person would think it opens a field of awareness and that's kind of blank. One could say so without the personal stories, there is this blank blankness, the blank awareness, so to speak. But that's another story because this isn't real either or this isn't real as well. When I was seeking, I used to hear this, you know, that there's a movie, there's a screen. And I think a lot of spiritual teachers talk about that. And, um, and then the question comes, well, who's watching then? You know, who's the watcher? Who's the observer? Who's the seeker? Can you elaborate on that one of why they say that? Well, um, well, I mean, it's just, um, what do you mean? The, the questions or the the screen page it, it's used to be used to it, it seemed to be really dualistic you know when someone's saying that i am watching the movie or i'm the writer of the movie or i am the actor something like that you know like it, it's it's an analogy that that there's a there's a screen and you are the screen and all that kind of stuff mm. well i think it's just the personal experience yeah in the end and most teachings are personal so one could even say within the dream that is when the self realized itself what it actually is and it's not even wrong i mean it's the me finding out hey actually i'm pure awareness i'm not my name i'm not my story i'm pure awareness which in a way is even true seen from the personal experience but it would still be within the dream. It wouldn't have anything to do with liberation. But That's what I thought too, yeah. 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 And I mean, it is logical. I mean, there are a lot of people who can follow that because it is their experience. You know, if you inquire, if the seeker inquires into its world, it can come to the same conclusions. Yeah, I'm not my story. That's true. What is there? What can I really say about myself? I am. What is this I am? Yeah, I'm aware. There is presence. I feel it. I'm aware of it. So it's, it's okay. almost like a romanticized spiritual idea of the dream now, right? I'm in a spiritual now and I'm the observer now of the dream. It's yeah. still a story. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that comes on top again, because it needs another story to, to, um, to fulfill itself. That's the funny thing with just being pure presence or to just hang out as pure presence becomes quite boring very quickly. So again, it has to tell a story about itself, being divine, being holy, being who I really am, stuff like that. And but, then there's this ultra-realization of the I am that. Can you explain what the I am that is? Well, <laughs> well, that's hard to say because I don't know how it was meant by Nisigadatta. But the person would understand I am that means I am that consciousness means I am the only reality. This would all lead to the conclusion that all there is is one. In regards to this non-dual message, so to speak, it would mean there is no separation. But there is no one having the experience of being that. It may sound a bit complicated. So this message might say, I am that, but there is no one having the experience of being that. All there is is what happens, but for no one. It's really simple though. Yeah, okay. Yeah, All right. yeah, yeah. Cool. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it sounded much more complicated because it is so simple because what we speak about is utterly simple because yeah. it is this no. <laughs> okay. all right this one uh from muji 
All the mind streams eventually flow into the ocean beingness. There are many pathways for the mind. There are no paths for the heart. For the heart is infinite and fills everything. By Muji. Oh, I mean, it's always, you know, you know, it's... Uh, I, I wouldn't use any of those words, so to speak, even this discrimination between mind and heart. And I just, I just have no idea what he means, so to speak. Because not, nothing leads, you know, it's all. All right. Can't, can't, uh, even, can't even comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <laughs> no comment, actually. Yeah, sorry. Next. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not even worth the comment. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, I'm joking. <laughs> We're going to get in trouble here. Uh, <laughs> for no one. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is from Adi Shankara. Just that the fire is the direct cost of cooking, so without knowledge, the emancipation can be had. Compared with the, all the other forms of dis dis discipline, knowledge of the self is the one direct means for liberation. Yes, I mean, it's always difficult with words because you always kind of end up saying it's obvious, it's, it is. But what this message points to is that what is talked about is like that. It's not conceptual. It's not trying to impose another idea or to talk about another abstract reality of wholeness. No, when it said this is all there is and it's naturally whole, it's pretty spot on and it's very direct, so to speak. It's so direct that it's not even pointing to it it's kind of revealing itself, not to anyone. Maybe that's what he meant. It's, it is this. There is no abstraction at all. We don't speak about anything. This doesn't point to anything that's separate. There is no hidden reality. This is not conceptual, basically. What I noticed with some of these codes is the, the use of word knowledge and or truth. Can you can you tell us what knowledge <laughs> or truth is? If there's no one, how can there okay, ex explain it? Exactly. It's impossible. It's impossible. You just can't go there. I mean, I mean sometimes, but I rarely say meanwhile anymore. But there's stuff, it's just obvious. You know, when I when I say there's just wholeness or all there is is what is. The, the immediate question of the seeker is, but who sees that? How do you know that? And either one says nothing or you end up saying something like, it's instantaneously obvious or stuff like that, which are all stories because there isn't something to be obvious. There isn't a reality to be known, but when there is no one, it just is like that for no one which can't be known, but how to describe that? It's impossible. It's impossible. And when, oh, when, sorry, or, sorry, one oh more. go ahead, go ahead. No, sorry. And I mean, the other thing is that if you have kind of a scripture from one of those guys, often those words are just loaded with meaning. You know, if, if Adi Shankara speaks about the highest knowledge and the highest truth, most my assumption is that most people, when they read it in their head, they immediately add those meaningful voice to those words, not just taking it as... Like an authority. This is the authority. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When there is no authority. What, what, what is that anyway? You yes. know, having an authority. Yes. All right. Yeah. This one is from Papa G. Experiences that come and go are not an experience of the permanent state. The per permanent state never comes and goes, and it is not experienced at one time, but not at other. 
Did you get that? <laughs> yes, I get that. And it's kind of, I, I might say the same thing. I might say the same thing. There is no experience. So there isn't a coming and going. But what you also says, which I like, is that there is also no experience of a certain reality. So the natural reality is totally inexperienced. Because a lot of spiritual teachings dance around this idea to leave what comes and goes and stay with what is or abide as what you really are. And if I heard it right, that was not what he said. Because the coming and going, the experience of something coming and going isn't replaced by an experience of how it really is. It's just the end of any kind of experience. Liberation, which is a story, would just be the end of any kind of experience. So there is no coming, there is no going, and there is no nothing that stays or remains. Thank you. Um, here's more from Rajan Klein from Who Am I? Go deeply into the urge to be silent and not the mental interference of how, where, and when. If you follow silence to its source, you can be taken by it in a moment. Yeah, well, I wouldn't. You know, the thing is that all those suggestions don't make sense to me because who would be able to do so? To me, that's, no, I'm sorry. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to go there. Here's another one that's similar to that one, but I just have to mention it. Feel nothing, know nothing, do nothing, have nothing, give up all to God and see utterly that will be done. We only dream this bondage, wake up and let it go. By Swami Vivekananda. Yes, I mean the book... <laughs> I mean, it's just hard with those with those quotes because you never really know how it was meant. But of course, it sounds as if as if it's a suggestion about what you could do and how to be. I wouldn't be able to say that at all. There isn't anyone who could or needs to do those things. It's impossible. Thank you. Here's one. This is a long one from Ajashanti. It's important that meditation is not seen as something that only happens when you're seated in a quiet place. Otherwise, spirituality and our daily life become two separate things. That's the primary illusion. And there's something called my spiritual life and something called my daily life. When we wake up to reality, we find they are all one thing. It's all one seamless expression of spirit. Yes, again, it's hard to say what he means. It might be it might be a description of waking up to oneself being consciousness, and then everything seems to happen within that consciousness, and everything seems to be the same, so to speak. Uh, some people would even say when waking up to who we really are, consciousness, everything is seen as being consciousness. Of course because whatever you are conscious of, you need your consciousness to be in. But if it was meant that way, it would be a total story. It would be describing another personal experience. And of course, I wouldn't use the, way, the word wake up because it's just the death of separation in which no, nothing wakes up, really. Brilliant, thank you. This one is from Ramana. Ramana Maharshi goes, give up thoughts, Give up thoughts. You did not give up anything else. Yeah, again, I wouldn't say so. I mean, you don't need to give up thoughts. The thing is that there just isn't anyone. And so, yeah. This one is from Nisargadatta, the famous one. I am that which knows that I am. Oh, oh dear. <laughs> 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 There's a bit too much knowledge in that for me. <laughs> I mean, it's funny with those things. Because in the end, it's not saying much. 
the seeker would imply that there is some that something that really knows that that he refers to some kind of knowledge but in the end by saying that how he said it it could also describe no thing it could also be a total description of no thing because it's utterly unknowable Thank you, just a second. Here is another one. Um, the mind is not your friend, not yet. Muji. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Imaginary friend, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. The, the, yeah, I mean, I mean, many, a lot of spirituality just circles around this idea with thoughts and that someone is bound by thoughts and that someone can become free from thoughts by whatever, by letting the thoughts come and go, by recognizing the mind to be whatever. I don't know. Here's one from uh, another one from Rupert Spira. However, love, peace, and happiness are inherent in the knowing of our own being. In fact, they are the knowing of being. They're simply other names for ourself. <sighs> yes, but it's this self which is illusory. <laughs> so my impression is that he he adds qualities to a personal to the personal experience. But my impression is that wholeness, what we speak about here, doesn't really have any qualities. Even when I say it's whole or it's naturally whole and complete, this doesn't really have qualities. All right. This one is from another one from Ramana. I cannot show you God or enable you to see God because God is not an object that can be seen. God is a subject. He is the seer. Don't concern yourself with objects can, that can be seen. Find out who the seer is. You alone are God. Yes. Again, it could be understood in two ways. Of course, the person would personalize it and end up saying, "I'm what I really am is awareness, and this is God. But in the end, what he also may point to is that all there is is what apparently happens, including the apparent seeing. Can you say the quote again? I, w I wanted to some. I wanted to say something else to him. I oh, you you skipped it already. Yeah, okay. I Just... already skipped it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <yeah. laughs> let me let me see if I can find it again. Yeah. Uh, I cannot show you God or enable you to see God because God is not an object that can be seen. God is the subject. He is the seer. Don't concern yourself with objects that can be seen. Find out who the seer is. You alone are God. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, that's what I say. It's either it's either describing the the personal the personal setup, or it may be a description for that, because it would also mean the same with I am that. I mean, the funny thing is what we speak about, wholeness, completion, is in that sense, sorry, is what everything is, and in that sense is also what we are. But it's not really something that can be experienced. In that sense, everything is purely what it is, which would be purely subjectivity but there isn't anything which experiences this to be everything. It just is everything. This one by Muji. Thank you for that one. I am the great waters upon my face, the primordial pen of Maha, Maha Maya, which means I think illusion, all which right. writes incessantly the lives and destinies of all living beings. Every wave, each ripple, subtlest movement is my dancing. Yet I, the pure reality, remain ever untouched, unaffected, glorious, and beyond all concepts. I, the unmanageable, the formless absolute, alone am. 
yes, yes. I mean, <laughs> it's for me how I would say this is way too much. This is way too much. <laughs> And it creates a and and in a very funny way it creates a separation between some kind of appearance, the dance, and something that is untouched. And in a very funny way, this again is the person's experience, because the person would experience itself as pure I am, which is always the same, so to speak, while the world is constantly changing. Of course, the person thinks to be um, touched by everything. That's what the person would regard as not being enlightened or entangled in the story. And the idea is when I recognize to be myself, when I recognize to be pure awareness, I see that I'm actually untouched by stories and that stuff. But those two don't exist. There is no separation. There is no wild appearance in which you can or in which you can get lost because this I isn't real as well. So to me, it seems like a very dual picture. I, I couldn't say that. <laughs> this one from Adi Shankara. Each thing tends to move towards its own nature. I always desire happiness, which is my true nature. My, tr my nature is never a burden to me. Happiness is never a burden to me, while sorrow is. <clears throat> Did you get that? Yeah, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> well, everything just exactly is what it is. So everything already is its true nature. There isn't really anything which isn't what seems to be happening. So to me, this is kind of still dancing around those ideas of, yeah, what he said, happiness and sorrow. Both are illusory in the end, as experience states. There is one from um, Yoga Paramahansa Yogananda. Man has hypnotized himself into thinking that he is a human being, where in reality he is one with God. Well, yeah, why not? <laughs> why not saying that? I mean, <laughs> no one did do that. No one did do the hypnotizing. But of course, self-consciousness thinking that I am something, a human being, a soul, a presence, an awareness, it's completely illusory. There is absolutely no separation from awareness. In that sense, why not saying that? Yeah. All right. Oh, probably he attaches a whole teaching to it and then it becomes a bit difficult. <laughs> <laughs> but having that statement, why not? So far, so good. I mean, the problem with hypnotizing is that you may, may come to the idea that you could dehypnotize yourself. But in the end, that there is I would be the dream, would be the hypnosis, which happens to no one in the end. Brilliant. Here is one from um, Rupert Spira. This absolute intimacy of pure experiencing is what we call love. It is the absence of distance, separation, or otherness. There's no room for two there. Love is the experience of pure non-duality. <laughs> <laughs> I love that reaction. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I can't, <laughs> I can't do. <laughs> I mean, it's a funny thing. Because to me, it seems to describe the personal experience, pure experiencing. And in a very funny way, one could say all those things that he says about it. But my impression is that it wouldn't, would need, or those statements would come from thinking it through, inquiring into it, and somehow trying to oppose that story on this pure experiencing. But there is no experiencing in the first place. 
in that sense, everything is unseparate. And there, one could also use the word intimate, but there is no separation at all. And there isn't even one thing. There is no thing. My impression, my impression is that within that statement, there is still one thing left, pure experiencing. But there is no pure experiencing. Beautifully said there. This one is from Robert Adams. Everything is holy. Everything is sacred. Do not believe that some things are sacred and some things are not. Everything is sacred, even man's inhumanity to man. The dastardly situations that appear in the world, it is hard for the human mind to understand these things. But everything is sacred. Everything is God. Yeah, why not? I mean, I wouldn't... I wouldn't use the word sacred and, and God. They are a bit too holy for me. But that's, that's, an utter, <laughs> well, but that's an utter surprise that when the sense of I am drops, that everything already is holy and complete for no one. And it's not a holy thing. In that sense, things being holy and complete is very ordinary. But yes, it's a surprise, kind of. An apparent surprise. <laughs> <Okay. sighs> <I'm sorry. laughs> no worries. This one, uh, in liberation, heart and mind are not experienced as being separate. So often non-duality can seem so heavy, so conceptual, so intellectual. All those concepts of nothingness and absence and presence. Actually, this is all about love. Love is the union of the heart and the mind. Non-duality isn't being attached from the world. Uh, being detached from the world, sorry, being the witness of everything and taking part in nothing. It's about, it's not about sitting on your mountaintop and looking down at the world, pitying those poor motors who aren't awakened as you are, those poor souls who still have egos. No, love cannot sta stand back from the world because it is the world. The heart of presence radiates love. Jeff Foster. Um. Well, yes and no. It was it was it was a long quote, and there were some things which I could say like that, and there are some things which I wouldn't say. So I can't really, I can't really remember it now, all of it. But um, so yes, all there is is what seems to be happening. What I found weird that he says what non-duality isn't, and then immediately presents an answer what it is: love, for example. <laughs> and uh, that it has something to do with presence and stuff. And yes, on the one hand, there are a lot of concepts about non-duality, and this is quite heady. But on the other hand, there isn't anyone present. So it's not about the union of anything as well, or to have a, a presence experience. And it's neither outside of the world, nor being in the world. There's just what seems to be happening, which is utterly unknowable. This is neither conceptual nor experiential, what we talk about here. There are a lot of people who, who understand, so to speak, that this isn't meant in a conceptual way but of course they immediately replace it with hoping that it's an experiential way, a way to live, love. It's not about the concepts of non-duality. It's about the experience of love, for example, but experiencing would be the dream. Brilliant. Um, this one is, just a moment here. The solution or the end of the seeking isn't the finding. That need to find something is never satisfied. It never happens. If it does, it's very temporary. I'll find something and I'm afraid of losing it. I'll find something and I'm afraid, afraid I'm trying to hold on to it. I'm trying something and I'm trying to maintain it. it never, it's never satisfied. The end of the seeking is the end of the seeker, is the end of the experience that this is real. Jim Newman. Yes, absolutely. Oh, yes. Oh, it just is like that, apparently. But I would just add that even when there seems to be 
the something found, it's completely illusory. To me, the illusion is to be on a path and to seek, and the illusion to have found something and having a break is the same illusion. They just go together. So nothing satisfies, not even in the moment where it seems as if I got something. There is no satisfaction in that. It's just the illusion of, oh, great, I got an answer. But it never met the need for wholeness. It never met the seeker's need. It was just an illusion of, great, I got something. Brilliant. Here's uh, the last one. Seekers discard the simplicity of what is and share the illusion they had to arrive there. They overhear the simplicity of the message and turn it into something difficult and complicated by Andreas Miller. Oh. <laughs> well, I, <said> that. <laughs> I mean, the thing is that the seeker faces this message as it faces life. And the seeker believes to live in this divided reality where everything is made out of numerous parts, processes, truths, and everything seems to be very complicated. And of course, it, <clears throat> it, all, it also tries to seize this in this message. It thinks that it's something, or it, it can think that it's very, something very complicated that we speak about. Some people would call this very abstract. Some people would call it the highest truth, which it completely isn't. It's simple. It's this. It's just this. There's nothing to, to know. There's nothing to realize. There's nothing to gain. There's nothing to be experienced even. So simple. Brilliant. Actually, I want to add another one or maybe a couple more. Yeah. Yeah. This I that wants to do, to do surrender to God is an illusion, Andreas Miller. Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, some people may think that the highest task or the main task is to surrender the I or to let go of the I. But this is the arrogance of the I, that there is an I who is able to surrender or to let go. It's funny. It sounds like such a humble idea, but as if there would be someone who can let go of him or herself. Well, it's very, er now. very earnest, though, right? It's very earnest, right? I'm going to surrender now. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Yes. Or one day, I now I practice surrender, but one day I will surrender completely. Yeah. Isn't it the dream of the I am to be God, though, right? It's almost like there's the seeker to be God. Well, of course. And in yeah. the end, the idea of being God is to be in charge. To be the one who decides. Even about his or her own, own surrendering. No, forget <laughs> it. There is no one. <laughs> You're not in charge. You can't even surrender. <laughs> you can't let go. Forget it. I often hear of let go and let God, you know, especially from my mom. Let go of? Let go and let God. Why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't want to give her my comment because she'll be shocked. But uh... <laughs> it's, it's, I'm sure it's well meant. Oh, yeah. Oh, totally. Totally. I, I love my mom. Absolutely. I love my mom. So. Yeah. <laughs> um... I, the recent, yeah, you, you have this brilliant uh, book of quotes, actually, The End of All Lockdowns. Mm, yes. That's where I got those quotes from. Oh, all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah that's... And it's, it's available, actually, on your website. Um, people can donate and, and download it. And uh, just and it's download it as a PDF, yeah. Just download it as a PDF. Um, when, I, when I was seeking desperately before, I had a book of quotes that I think I, I, I saved for 10 years and I would just flip it and I would be kind of like, wow, this quote from, you know, when, when I was teaching and I would just flip and then I would add my own version to it. 
I cringe at that now. I have thrown that book, you know, when when this apparent seeking has dropped away. And I was like, ah, mm-hmm. oh, reading through it. I'm like, this is this is all dualistic stuff. And I used to add my own dualistic view to it. You- <laughs> <laughs> so this apparent message, you know what I'm saying, is almost a deprogramming of, of you know, 10 years or I don't know how many years. It's an illusion, but all of this accumulated um, quotes. And I like particularly when, when the quote mentioned God. And I was like, oh, or the truth, oh, yeah, or absolutely. the knowledge, right? I'll be like, let me read to you this quote that says about knowledge. Yeah. To me, it's just the same thing as reading the Bible. You know what I'm saying? Like, let me go to Matthew verse 10, you know, and then a preacher interprets it. Totally, totally. Yeah. Absolutely. Did you like quotes before too, Andreas, before this apparent um, Oh, yeah, think it never happens yeah, yeah of course i mean i never i never read too much i read some spiritual books and also from gurus but of course i mean those quotes and exactly as you said i mean the word truth knowledge highest truth um, yeah. realization self-realization i mean those words they sounded great and there was a lot of admiration even by reading those and by people talking about it and stuff like that. Oh, of course. I mean, it may it may give an uplifting feeling immediately. Like, yeah, oh, yeah, the highest. Oh, yeah. truth. <laughs> <laughs> with a picture of with a picture of a mountain, you know, and a person standing there. Yeah, exactly. usually in a meme. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Or a sun or a sunset, you know, in a beach. You know what I'm saying? One of those nice pictures. And uh, when, when I used to make those memes, you know what I'm saying? And I would put this quote and, and people would like them. And I'm like, oh, this quote must be really great. Um, but now it, it's funny because I don't really pay attention to any quotes anymore. In fact, when I researched for the quote, I just Googled non-duality quotes and I just read it to you. I didn't yeah. even pay attention to it. Yeah, <laughs> if you notice, know I was just going through the internet. <laughs> <laughs> so simple. <laughs> Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, the, the, those are empty. I mean, in a way, I mean, you know, sometimes I read quotes or people send me quotes or I read. And sometimes when I meet, meet this message, there's just this apparent recognition of, oh, yeah, of course, or something like that. But it's totally empty of meaning and the attempt to turn it into something special. There's just this, it's apparent, but there's just a, this recognition. Oh, yeah, great. That's how I would say, or I can say yes to this, or the apparent recognition that it's just a story. I mean, yeah. either way, it would be a story. But what do you think not, about pointers? Not loaded at all. Again, pointers. I used to. I yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. What do you think about pointers? <laughs> Yeah, I don't like the concept of pointing very much. I mean, in the end, there are words and. I also sometimes say this is an apparent point too. But again, for me, this is another way to, to me often it sounds, uh, again, kind of holy or meaningful. Of course, it's often pointed out that the pointers aren't what's pointed to, (laughs) but they are still the pathway to that. So they still are a bit higher in the hierarchy so to speak. I agree. Yeah. I used to, um, I used to fall asleep and, you know, listening to the Sargadada pointers and hoping that I would get the point when there's so no point. Speak, exactly. Yeah. Still points to there being a path. And I mean, for the seeker, the path is holy. So path, <laughs> to be on the right path is the most important thing. So pointers immediately are becoming very important. Or it becomes a method. You know, it, people it think a, it's a it method. method. Yeah. And the yeah. point, again, is regarded as something in the future, as not there, as an abstract thing. Which I is what the best. Person, which just reflects the person's experience. I'm here and wholeness is somewhere else in the future or not there. I think the best point here is the point is there's no point. <laughs> Uh, Uh, well thank you so much andreas um if um we should do one of this with your book 
You know what I'm saying? And just unexpanded. You know, you have, I think about 30, how many quotes do you have there? There's 42 pages and it's a whole bunch of different quotes. Um, and it's beautiful. I, I would love to do that. I don't collect them anymore. I just, I just read them and they're, they're quite brilliant. Uh, yeah. Cool. Okay, yeah. I'm going to pause this right now. Thank you so much.